Well, it's Wednesday, the 26th of April, and it's time to take a look inside the reports that were recently released by the Department of Water Resources. My name's Juan Brown, and you're watching the Blanco Lario Channel. The three reports are compiled with the uh, Department of Dam Safety, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and the Independent Board of Consultants working together with DWR. There are three re reports, one dated 10 March, then 17 March, and 20 one March. Remember the 10 March report came out public and uh, we reported on that uh, as soon as it came out and then right after that report came out Department of Water Resources clammed up and decided that this is critical energy infrastructure information and prevented the release of the subsequent two uh, reports until the public demand and pressure got too great uh, and uh, I want to thank our um, local elected officials for keeping the pressure on the feet of DWR and getting him to finally re release these last two reports uh, even with the CEII information redacted. Remember critical energy infrastructure information is exempt from the uh, Freedom of Information Act and that's how DWR was able to not release these reports. These reports are a great insight into the very fluid and dynamic situation at or Oroville, resulting in one of the greatest engineering feats we've probably not seen since World War II. What it really illustrates is how, how under extreme time constraints, designers, engineers, and contractors are coming up with the plan while implementing the plan nearly simultaneously. We got the last of the cool wet or moist weather moving through the area today, Wednesday the 26th of April. And then I think after this we're going to turn suddenly to summertime. When this last cold front moves through, which is only resulting in just a tiny bit of rain, the last three fronts have resulted in less than a quarter of an inch of rain up here at 3200 feet. When this passes through, we're going to get a north wind. It's going to dry out fast and heat up quickly and we'll suddenly be in summer-like conditions. And I don't see any more wet weather on the horizon. Today, Wednesday, 26 April, the lake level stands at 849 and a half feet. Debris field, as uh, they have so far removed over 1.6 million cubic yards of material out of the Thermalito Diversion Pool. Outflows, 37,000 CFS, so they're getting at least 2,000 CFS from the Hyatt Power Plant. Again, partially operating the Hyatt Power Plant while they begin to do the repair work on Penstock Tunnel Number 1, effectively shutting off half of the Hyatt Power Plant. Inflows, about 20 to 25,000 CFS in. Snow survey, uh, one of the final snow surveys of the season will be on 1 May, and we'll get a good look at the present snowpack. And starting tomorrow, Thursday, 27 April, is the beginning of a series of community outreach meetings by DWR. And I plan to attend this first one at Gridley, the Butte County Fairgrounds in Gridley tomorrow evening, starting at 5.30 p.m. I hope to see a lot of you folks there, especially the folks from Evacuation Area 1A. And let's see what kind of answers we can get from DWR as to the current situation at Oroville. So with that, we'll go inside and take a closer look at the last, the latest plan, the 31 March plan, and see what's going on. So if we go here to the Department of Water Resources page, Orville Spillway Incident, scroll down, and here's your three reports. First, let's dive into the second report, the 17 March report, as it indicates to me that they got a clear understanding of what caused this spillway failure in the first place. Here on page nine, paragraph six, they talk about, the failure likely occurred as a result of high velocity flow in the range of 85 to 90 feet per second penetrating under the slab. That's a little more velocity than we were uh, assuming, causing a strong uplift force and causing the slab to lift, eventually causing all or part of the slab to break away. Subsequent erosion of the foundation material caused progressive failure both upstream and downstream. So, just as we suspected and been talking about all this time, it was water intrusion underneath the slab that, that caused the failure. How did the water get underneath the slab? Through the cracks that were improperly or insufficiently repaired over the years. And also mentioned in here is the uh, basic inadequacy of the primary design itself, which will be addressed in the subsequent design. This next design is gonna be hell for stout. 
For all the fans of the cavitation theory, it is mentioned here as a minor role. But they are going to add aeration to the new design to help prevent cavitation, even though they claim cavitation was, played only a minor role in the failure of this spillway. By the way, here's how DWR dealt with the redacted information. They just simply blacked it out. Yet they left the critical energy infrastructure do not release warning on the bottom of the page. Pro tip in handling classified information. If you redacted the information and it is no longer classified, then remove the classification from the bottom of the page. It just adds to confusion. Ask Hillary Clinton about that. I would also suggest if you want to redact something, just leave it out of the report instead of blacklining it here. This kind of, you can kind of read in between the lines what the redacted information is here. Okay, now let's dive into the latest report, 31 March. First, let's look at the design parameters that they want to design this project to. The busted spillway, the main spillway, is now called the flood controlled outlet, parentheses gated spillway. The interim repairs, that is what we want to get done by, what they want to get done by this fall, they want to have the ability to outflow 270,000 CFS. With a final long-term repair capability from the main gated spillway of 300,000 CFS. So this is an improved gated spillway. I think the present or the previous capability of the main spillway was something on the order of 270,000 CFS. Now check out this on the emergency spillway. The interim repairs, that work that they're getting done right now, <clears throat> they want to be able to have the emergency spillway handle a peak flow of 30,000 CFS. Remember when this evacuation occurred and the erosion that we saw, the flow over the emergency spillway was only 12,000 CFS. But look at this design requirement. The long-term repairs to the emergency spillway are to pass a peak flow of 371,000 CFS. So this design implements the very situation that we're in right now, something that wasn't considered in the original design, an emergency spillway that's allowed to handle all the flow out of Oroville in the event that you lose control or lose the ability to use the main spillway. Remember at 160,000 CFS, that's the maximum historically they've ever let out of Orville Reservoir. Above 160,000 CFS and you really start damaging levees downstream. Now I understand we, we have to have a, a system designed to allow for extreme events in order to save the Oroville Dam. In other words, you're gonna, you've got to have a design that's willing to sacrifice infrastructure downstream in order to save a catastrophic loss of the Oroville Dam. Those of you concerned about earthquakes, and rightfully so, everything in California is designed with earthquakes in mind, including this project. The permanent design should be able to handle a 6.5 on the Richter scale earthquake from the Cleveland Hills Fault with a full reservoir of 901 feet. How do you achieve that design requirement? Lots of rebar and lots of solid anchoring to solid bedrock below. And here's your standard call out, not much more than conventional construction, 28 day concrete, 5,000 PSI and 60,000 PSI re rebar. Standard call outs, even by today's standards, construction standards with corrosion protection. Realizing the time constraints of this project to get something in place by this fall, the contracts have been split up into two contracts. Contract number one is to replace the upper spillway, not repair, but replace, remove and replace the upper spillway and get it up to the capability of 270,000 CFS. And contract number two is to remove and replace the lower spillway. And that contract is to run beyond this fall. Well, both contracts are probably going to run beyond this fall, but contract number one needs to be done by this fall. Blasting is addressed here on the left side of the spillway, left side looking down in an effort to get this 
in an effort to get this 150 foot nearly vertical drop blasted and cut back to increase worker safety down below. Here, here they are getting it cut back, getting it trimmed back in order to prevent that steep edge from collapsing into the canyon, creating debris into the debris field and creating a hazard for everybody working down below, especially the geotech folks. So they're doing low levels of blasting deep underground just to bust that rock up, crack it so they can easily excavate it. And this blasting is going away far, far away from the dam itself. Another design conundrum, which addresses the initial failures, how do you design an expansion joint that's waterproof? And they're gonna need a lot of them because this design is talking about concrete slabs, much smaller size, not thickness, but 30 foot by 30 foot square slabs dropped into place, resulting in a lot of expansion joints. And so a lot of consideration is being given to the proper drainage and waterproofness of this design. Considerable discussion regarding the drainage design for the spillway shoots took place. Um, the new slab will be thicker, panel dimensions will be much smaller, 30 by 30, and will be more heavily reinforced. That's a reinforcing rebar, steel rebar. These provisions will make the slab much less prone to developing such shrinkage or temperature cracks. On page 11. Not only did this original spillway appear to fail at an expansion joint, it also failed at a point where the spillway takes a considerably steeper descent downhill, and that's addressed here too. Even though cav cavitation was not a uh, primary cause, but a contributing factor, they're, con they're considering adding provi provisional air slots. So they're gonna introduce air into the design where the, where the velocity of the water really gets going fast to help minimize the effect of cavitation. Very interesting. And then finally talking about more problems with the initial design, not only being thick enough, but a lot of the original gated spillway was laid down right on top of soil and barely anchored down at all to bedrock. So now they're talking 15 to 30 feet worth of embedment into existing bedrock on the new design. And the same problem with the emergency spillway, and I think this redacted portion here uh, is related to why they had to evacuate when they saw the erosion on the emergency spillway. So that's just some of the design features of the new spillway at Orville, the main gated spillway and the emergency spillway. Looking at these reports, I'm convinced that they do have a very clear understanding as to what caused the failure of the original spillway design and are going to build a spillway of a much more robust design in the future. And now the race is on to see if they can get this design built in the amount of time that Mother Nature allows us. Stay tuned.